And um, you know, when we do when we do our uh, themes, Lent, Advent, so forth, or, or do preaching series, I always start with the uh, the end in mind. And so back in January, wherever whenever we planned this, um, started here with this scripture. And oh, okay. So that's Wesley, and I need to turn this down so I can hear them. So if you don't know, we uh, are have different campuses at Grandview. Um, that uh, uh, the sermon is is live streamed into Wesley over in East Dubuque and at Center Grove at 10:45. And uh, we have a staff member uh, named Crystal that's like the campus pastor and leads worship over there. And so they're about to go live, and so I have a little monitor, um, you know, so I can feel like I'm preaching to those people too. That's what that's all about. Back on this scripture, if you've got your Bibles, you can see what it is. This is where I started. And all through Lent, I've talked about seeing and not seeing, about things being in plain sight, but we miss it. You know, we miss it. We have blind spots and um, about how God reveals uh, things to us. And, and, and we need to ask God to help reveal things to us. So I, I started here back in January saying, this is what I want to talk about on Easter Sunday. And it's after the resurrection. It's after Jesus had started to appear to different people. But understand that all of his followers, they were all in a now what moment. They, they, their world was turned upside down uh, to see Jesus, uh, what happened to him after uh, what we think of as the Last Supper, and, and to see him die, to die and his dead body taken off the cross and put into a, a cave, into a tomb. So here's two more. And these weren't the big name ones. These weren't the rock star disciples, Peter, James, and John. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and as they discussed, I would say, what they're doing is lamenting. To lament is to try to make sense of things. This shocking thing had happened and they're processing it. Lamenting. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus asked these two disciples, What are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stopped, they stood still, their faces were downcast, and one of them, uh, Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened? there in these days? And Jesus asked, what things? And so these two go on to talk about, well, Jesus of Nazareth, we thought he was going to redeem Israel. We had high hopes. And, and, and then some of our, uh, uh, you know, companions, after he was killed, they, they uh, said he's gone. Even his, his body's gone. And then there's some uh, that uh, went to the tomb and they, they, they saw it's just like the women said. And you pick back up in verse 25. Jesus said to them, how slow and foolish you are, slow of heart to believe all the th- prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And it says that as they walked, Jesus walked with them and he, he, he started going through it all. You know, it was a seven mile walk. He started going through the prophets and the prophecies and what was said about the messianic age and about the promises of God. And then verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, strongly, stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened And they recognized Jesus. And then he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he talked with us on the road and opened scripture up to us. And it says they then got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. And I'm guessing they went back to Jerusalem a lot faster than they had walked to Emmaus. And they went back and said, we have seen the Lord. The walk to Emmaus story, right? Two disciples, as I said, not the rock stars, ordinary people, real people. And they're leaving Jerusalem, they're leaving Passover week, and they're sad. 
They're very sad. They're overwhelmed. They're trying to make sense of things. And as they talk about Jesus, Jesus shows up, which is probably a whole other sermon, but it's true. When you talk about Jesus, he tends to show up. That's why we do things like read scripture and go to cell groups. You talk about God and the presence of God, and it happens. That's what happened on the walk to Emmaus, right? So they're talking about Jesus, and they're talking about their lost hope, and they're talking about their sense of now what? Again, they've moved beyond why, I think. And I think they're just saying, what do we do now? Now what do we do? I, I think of those, those first two disciples were in the fog, and they were in the darkness. Fog and darkness. Think about that. I mean, you know what those things are. But specifically, they were in the fog and darkness of grief and of sadness and of hopelessness and true uncertainty about the future, right? And because of that, they failed to see Jesus in plain sight. In other words, and, and, and this is something all through Lent, we've been talking about this, their grief and their sadness, their, their, their shock, being stunned, obstructed their view. It restricted their view. There was Jesus with them, present with them all along, right? But they didn't see him. They didn't see or let's think about it like presence. They didn't sense, feel. They didn't experience the presence of Jesus. They couldn't put words to it, right? And yet, think about this. There was something about this stranger. We know it's Jesus. There was something about this stranger and all that he had to say to them that moved them to, to, to urge him strongly, is what the scripture says. Like, like to hold on to his coat or to grab his arm and say, please stay with us. No, no, stay with us. There was something about him, I contend. And then what happened? I just read it. But what happened? Well, like sunrise, like sunrise. There are some of us outside this morning, okay? Some of us were outside this morning at 530, getting things ready for the sunrise service and it was dark and Alec had to pull his truck up and shine the lights and you know he was setting things up and then what happened sunrise happened and we didn't need the truck lights anymore what happens when the sun comes up well the fog and the darkness get pushed back they get lifted and what happened to those two disciples in the Emmaus village obviously in that house what happened was was this day spring from on high those words like Zechariah used about God's coming, about the presence of God, about light from heaven coming to shine upon those who are living in darkness in the shadow of death. That's a way to understand what happened in that house in Emmaus is that divine light, divine light, light from heaven happened. And what? They saw Jesus in plain sight. They, changed, they saw Jesus in plain sight and go back to the road. When they were walking with him on the road, again, their, their sight was restricted and obstructed. But yet they then said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us? In other words, somehow, some way, these two disciples walking with Jesus right there with them, they didn't know it was him. They couldn't put words to it, but there was something going on. There was something going on inside of them, in their heart, if you will, in their emotions, their feelings, maybe in their, in their head. But they said, our heart was burning within us somehow, some way. They were tuned into the presence of God. Does that make sense to everybody? If so, say yes. They were tuned in. They didn't know it. They couldn't put words to it. And I would say again, this was heaven shining down upon them. They just didn't know it yet. And so today, here's what I want you to know, and this is important. I want you to know this, that Jesus being there, right? Day spring from on high, divine light, the presence of God. In the midst of hard times, in the midst of struggle times, was not just a one and done thing that happened a long time ago. Amen? I want you to believe that. It wasn't just something that happened uh, to these two people a long time ago, and it was kind of interesting and unique, and it got written about. What I want you to know and hear, but what I mostly want you to grab hold of and believe is that this event, this Emmaus thing happened, and it's a message about how God works, okay? It's a message. The walk to Emmaus, the road to Emmaus scripture, this event is a message, about how our God works in this life. And that message is not just for other people. This message is for you, and it's for me. It's for all of us who sometimes walk in the shadow of death and run into those times of some struggle and some frustration 
those, those times uh, when we try to make sense of the world. Again, I'm going to say it. This wasn't just a one and done. It's a message for right now and going forward about how our God works with you, his loving creation, right? Light from heaven, the presence of God is available to all believers. Hear that. It's available to all people. There are some people both outside this building and some of you sitting in here right now, some of you over at Wesley and some of you online that may think that the good news the good news of resurrection and the good news of God's presence of divine light from heaven. You may think it's just for someone else and that I'm talking to someone else. There are people, sadly, that feel like they're too bad, that they're too sinful, that they're too far from God, that there's no hope for them. And I'm pushing back saying, no, you couldn't be more wrong. And it's a matter of life and death. Light from heaven, the presence of God is available to all believers. And we especially need it when we're going through those times when fog and darkness are making life difficult, when fog and darkness are making it difficult to make sense of life, you know, and we may be in a now what time and feel hopeless. You know, and putting this together, it made me think about something that happened a long, long time ago. I was probably 12 or 13, so it was a long time ago, okay? I remember the first time that I got to go deer hunting with my dad, okay? And, and the first time I got to sit on a, on a stand, on a deer stand, which when you're the young guys in the family, sitting on deer stand is so much preferable to, you know, when you're the young guys, you have to walk over, um, you know, like a disc and plowed fields, uh, hard, frozen, and drive the deer for the old guys to shoot. I'm not sure. I think that's very, very fair. Matt, you're a deer hunter. Is that, you know? Um, so sitting on stand was really cool. And um, so a couple of days before opening deer season, is anybody in here deer hunt? just so I know who, who can relate to this, okay? Some of you can't, some of you can't, but just, it's okay. You know, uh, basically this, is it a couple of days before dad took me out to this place where we hunted and they'd one time been a farmstead, whatever. My deer stand was at the base of an old windmill. And, and uh, there was a milk crate, a little milk crate in there and a carpet, you know, like, why do I have a carpet, dad? It's like, well, because you're going to get cold out here, son, and the carpet keeps your feet a little bit warmer. Okay. So dad, we went out and looked at it and I was excited. And now dad's like, now you're going to sit here and you know, the weeds are all grown up. It's a perfect and the trails come here and here. And dad said, it was weird. He said like numerous times, I'm going to be over there in my stand. Don't shoot that way. Right. You know, <laughs> Like, you're left hand. I'm left handed. I swing this way. So, like, okay, okay, I'm excited. So, opening day deer season comes. And so, you know, like, what, five in the morning or something, we park a ways away and, and, and we're walking in. And, and my uncles and uh, my cousins are going to their stands and, you know, around in this big area. And so, we're, we're getting there, and dad walks me over to my stand and, and uh, uh, again, reminds me not to shoot him, right? <laughs> you know, and um, so anyway, I'm sitting on that deer stand. And here's one thing I remember. I remember it really clearly, is, uh, you know, uh, how you sit in the cold and the dark. You sit in the cold and the dark for a couple of hours. And again, some of you that have never done this, you can imagine that. Is that when you sit in the cold and the dark for, you know, a couple of hours and, um, you know, some of the adrenaline bleeds off from the excitement of being out there, every sound seems amplified. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like your hearing turns crystal clear right? But so does your imagination get amplified, right? And so you sit in the dark, you sit there, right? It's like dark and shadows. And, and, and I can remember that and, and other times that I would go out on deer stand. And it's a little bit disorienting, right? It's like, it's like you sit there when you're 12 or 13, you're, you're like, what, what am I actually looking at out there? Is it, uh, I think that might be Bigfoot. I think maybe Bigfoot is, is coming or What was that noise? Are those wolves? Maybe wolves are, you know, your imagination, it can happen, right? You're in the cold, you're in the dark, and, and, uh, you know, it's what I call the the parade of the imaginary horribles, right? And people have the parade of the imaginary horribles, not just when they're on deer stand, uh, but, you know, that a lot of times happens in the middle of the night. And what the parade of the imaginary horribles is, is it's like a parade, Fourth of July parade or whatever, with floats and different uh, people in it. And it parades through your minds. It's, it's, all these horrible, terrible things, the worst things that could happen to you, your worries and your fears parade through your mind. And it's horrible. It's rotten in the middle of the night. Has anybody ever had watch that parade in the middle of the night? Say yes. Okay. I was thinking about that. But I was also thinking about all those years ago, you know, sitting at the bottom of that windmill, that as the sun started to lighten the sky, 
I could see things more clearly. And you all know that. I could see that, oh, that's the trees and uh, that's uh, some old machinery in the weeds. And, and uh, oh, I, now I know for sure where my dad's at. He's over there. I won't shoot that way, right? You know, with the sun, the sun came up, not, not the big ball of fire right away, but the sky begins to lighten and suddenly you begin to see things clearly. And my point in telling you this story is this simple truth, a simple truth about how literal Literal, actual day spring from on high, sunrise, light from the sky, changes everything. Does that make sense? Say yes. It changes everything. Takes away the fear, takes away the more imaginary horribles, takes away the whole thing of, is that Bigfoot sneaking up on me? I've seen movies about this, right? It takes it away. Everything changes. Everything changes when you can see. It's a simple truth, and it's also a simple truth. It's also a simple truth that people from time to time that we're very much like those early disciples walking to Emmaus, right? Is it, again, things happen. Circumstances out of our control. Things aren't working. We get frustrated. Some things are shocking. We get, we get shocking surprises. And we then are confused or we're frustrated or we're angry. And, and life is just out of whack. It's out of, out of balance. And it's like fog and darkness is a simple truth. Those times when we try to make sense of things. Those times that we're like trying to find rocks in the river, like the river's rising and the stream's getting stronger and we just need a solid place to stand. Those are those times, right, where we need security and we need assurance and we need confidence. And most of all, I think we need hope. And so there are people walking around like this that are walking to Emmaus right now. Some of you are in the room right now. Some of you are over at Wesley. Some of you are online. And I'm not asking you to jump up and shout and raise your hand. I'm just saying, think about this. There are some people, and maybe it's you that's on a walk to Emmaus, and you may feel like you're plodding along in the dark, disoriented and scared and hostage, hostage to seeing imaginary horribles. And it's real, right? It's real. But so is this message that you need to hear because it's real. And it's a real message for people like you and people like me. And that message is this. It's, see, Easter, Easter makes it possible to pray and to cry out and say, God, shine your light into my life. Easter makes it possible because God can do anything but fail. Amen? Okay. And God can show up and God can bless anything unless we don't ask unless we fail to ask. Easter makes it possible to say, God, shine your light on me. Merciful God, help me to see more clearly that you are in plain sight and I'm not alone. And the promise that God makes is that God will show up. Is that God, you see, as we've talked about already this morning, is that God keeps his promises. And so when we pray that prayer, when we cry it out, when we say, God, shine your light on me, right? And when we start to do some things, when we repent, that's important. That's where we started at Lent. When we turn to God and away from the sin and away from disobedience and selfishness and all those things, when we confess our sins, when we receive forgiveness, when we accept forgiveness, and when we accept and trust the truth that our loving God has defeated destruction and darkness and death, when we, when we really truly believe that, when we believe that day spring from on high has come, and when God's light comes into your life, it will change everything and help you to see differently God with us. Now, every year I pick a song, and, and Alec always gives me some different choices, lyrics and so forth, for, for, for Easter Sunday and for Christmas Eve. And this is just something that we do here at Grandview is, a, is a, I picked a song, I picked a song uh, for this morning that repeats this message of hope. I picked a song for this morning that, 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 that names some of the questions and some of the uh, uh, angst and anxiety, that names some of the, the, the wonderings that we have. But the chorus is about that prayer. The chorus is about that pleading with God to change things. And I'll say it again. It's possible for God to change things wherever you are and whatever's going on. I invite you to listen or maybe even sing along uh, to this message right now.
Yeah, I'm glad you came to rock the house with us today, but more importantly, it's the message. Don't miss the message. No matter where you are, no matter what's going on, there's hope. Hang in, hold on, don't give up, and pray for that light, that divine presence of God to come into your life in new ways, in different ways. Open your eyes. You may be surprised that Jesus is with you, is with you, and you may not even realize it. So indeed, Heaven, let your light shine down on me and upon all of you. If you close your eyes with me, let's pray once again. Lord God, I pray that since you know us and know who we are and where we are and what we're all about, Lord God, I pray today on this Easter day, I pray, Lord, that indeed you draw us closer to you, that you do adjust our vision and help us to see you and to know you. I pray, Lord, that today, And as we go through this week, Lord, I pray that there's points that our hearts will burn within us because you are close to us. I pray that you make it so in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, all of us pray together in one voice the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.